going on guys we're back out here it's been quite a while um, the GSX has not moved for a month figured I'd throw that one right out there uh, doing the hood took quite a while and it's on here now it's still it's still dirty under here I'm gonna clean this thing off today get it all put back together the way I want it um, I had to go into the hood here while it was off and I had to cover a bunch of stuff with plastic wrap and plastic bags and just you know keep it safe while the hood was off and it was out in the elements and uh, there's some little spots that got surface rust on them, like some bolts and stuff. So I came out here with the jug of Evaporust that is not 99% alcohol. My Evaporust jug decided that it didn't want to spray anymore. Basically just uh, going through everything with a wire brush and cleaning everything off, getting it back to the way it was, putting a little WD-40 on the bolts, making sure they're shiny. And we're doing an oil change. I've got some uh, conventional Valvoline VR1 down here that we're going to use. Uh, just drained the oil out, pulled the filter off, and let me show you the hood real fast. It's actually kind of sad right now. It's covered in pollen, just gobbed with pollen. The whole car is. It's actually filthy. So this thing's going to get a bath. Uh, since I got the new laptop computer, I haven't had a chance to uh, come out here and plug into it yet because if you swap your computer out, ECM link doesn't really translate over. And you can still see all the sanding dust from the Bondo and all that, these white lines going across the driveway. It's just a mess out here, guys. It's been a very busy couple of weeks. Also, I noticed that uh, the quick release bumper straps that I have here, those little rubber bands, both of them on both sides were broken off when I came out here today. Luckily, Amazon carries those, and I got a case of 30 of them coming because they really don't last that long. I'm gonna have to find a different uh, means of attaching this front bumper. Uh, stock, it's not gonna happen can't put the stock stuff back on I do have all the uh, plastic push pins in the wheel well and the plastics and all that but anyways you guys don't care about that this car is filthy I had to do a bunch of things uh, if you look way back in the channel we installed a light system underneath this heat shield so we could see to work on this thing at night that was when we were at a smaller place didn't have a uh, my own spot in the driveway really and we had a bunch of neighbors in the apartment house we were in now we don't have to worry about that so I got rid of that. I have lights on stands now if I need them. A lamp that I can put on my head, whatever. No garage, but got rid of those lights. Also, the uh, sprayers right here. This hose that goes to the windshield sprayers. I had to uh, cut that line because I couldn't get these plastic clips out without breaking them. Um, and I just reinstalled a little splice, a little tube in there. So those will work again. I'm doing all the little things that over the last three, four, or five weeks, about four and a half weeks now we'll say all those little things that I had to do to get this hood off and do all the painting work I'm now going back through and trying to fix all the other stuff remove the electrical for the lighting system all that stuff's in the trash we're doing a fresh oil change there's a little bit of rust I have to take care of still on the exhaust manifold there you can see it right on that little edge it looks horrible so and I gotta wipe down everything so I'm gonna get a bucket of water out here in a little bit but first I gotta slap on our k and oil filter. Fill this thing up with Valvoline VR1 racing oil. It's uh, 20W50. I think you guys probably saw that. Oh, and we have this beautiful little Ford back here again. Uh, turns out, this is that one we did the head gasket on. After we did the head gasket, it drove for a good amount of time, and then I guess, unbeknownst to us, there was some sort of crack or something in the block because I mean, we didn't really know what happened to it. Basically, the guy had it, and uh, I think his ex-girlfriend took it, and she crashed the front end of it, and that's why there's a chunk missing out of the bumper. And she decided to just continue driving it after she had an accident. Apparently, what she ended up doing was pulling into like a, uh, a riverside lookout area where you could park on the side of the river and read a book or hang out at a park bench or whatever. Nice little nature scene in the Adirondacks area. And she cut the corner too short, and she ran over a giant boulder that was like the... Uh, basically the corner of the entryway for you to pull in. There's two boulders on either side. I'm sure you guys have seen something like that before. She didn't see it, she hit it, and it cracked the radiator. All the juice came out of the car, no antifreeze, and then she ended up driving it six miles down the interstate, going 70 miles an hour, and got to a different exit. The car started acting really funny, warning lights came on, so instead of stopping, she turned back around, jumped back on the highway, drove it the seven miles back to where it initially had happened, and drove the car up to her mother's house up a big hill so basically this thing had no antifreeze in it for about 15 miles and it was just maxed out 
we checked it all out and me and another mechanic actually were looking at it he was unavailable for uh, the head gasket on it but we did put the head gasket in it it did fire up it did have compression it didn't mix any of the fluids and everything was fine and about I don't know a month or so after he was driving it uh, we noticed that the uh, thing started using coolant again and we checked and now you can actually uh, there must have been a hairline crack someplace in the block that I missed or that they missed um, all I was supposed to do is throw the head gasket on it but uh, apparently now if uh, you put pressure to the coolant system on this car the coolant drips out of the uh, oil drain plug so I got it down here checked it out and that is exactly the case so someplace there's a fracture either in the head or there's a fracture in one of the coolant passages inside of the block which is probably what it is there's probably an internal crack someplace because we did check the head out and we you know, we looked at everything it looked fine so anyways you guys aren't here to look at a Ford Focus or the blue Ford Focus we have a new motor coming for that thing we're gonna swap that out probably not gonna record it uh, but today I'm just doing a bunch of this stuff getting this thing put back together getting it ready to fire up and then I got to bring out ECM link and reinstall and set up my data logging page so I figured I'd show you some of this stuff to you guys and if your laptop crashes what you have to do to get ECM link running properly again it's really not that difficult it's more or less just a pain to go back through after you reinstall factory ECM link and type in all your parameters again and set up your wideband and set up your your uh, map sensor all that stuff speed density you got to go through the settings and all that again so we'll jump back in with the uh, laptop in a little bit and I'll show you guys how to do that from download to uh, data log basically so I'm going to start cleaning the stuff off, fill it up with oil, and we're going to keep the show moving. Fortunately for me, after having the uh, hood pulled off of here, uh, we did get a small storm before I got the plastic over everything and it just kind of lightly rained out here. Then I covered everything up. Looks like I was a little too late and some water got underneath this little cover right here and unfortunately caused this paint to bubble, but that's fine because we actually have plans to uh, repaint this whole thing. It started peeling a while ago, like little parts of the edges and stuff. and. Some of the paint just never really stuck. I did this in the driveway at the first apartment, probably within six to eight weeks of me starting the channel. And it's just a rattle can with like barely any prep work. Tried to degrease it, didn't do a very good job, but this is gonna come off. We're gonna fix this up because it's very cloudy and we're gonna paint this cover also. So there's a bunch of things that we're gonna be still working on under here. Luckily, none of the water got into the holes uh, as far as the spark plug tubes go. They're raised up off the bottom here. I don't know, it didn't look like it was as close to getting into the spark plugs as I thought. It was about halfway up the uh, rim here. Anyway, it's bubbled the paint just a little bit. I'm good with that. I want this thing to run today, and we're going to clean under this engine bay a little bit, get it all wiped down, get the rest of the dust and the pollen out of here. That valve cover, that uh, spark plug cap, and our timing cover are all going to come off the car next week, and we're going to put the stuff downstairs, get the paint booth back going on, and uh, we're going to try to make all this look clean again. I want to actually gloss black the valve cover instead of the uh, wrinkle black. I didn't know when I did it, but I saw so many other people use wrinkle black. And the best way to do it is apparently clean whatever you're painting off. Get it a light rough like a 500 grit or 600 grit sandpaper and uh, put a little scratch on it. And as you lay the paint, you're supposed to use a heat gun. Didn't know that. So uh, I never got the optimal wrinkling as most folks do. So... Anyways, that sucks that that happened, but I guess uh, live and learn, and we're going to fix that here next week. So let's uh, continue along here. I'm going to put all this stuff back together for now, uh, get everything wiped off, get the outside of this car cleaned off, because, oh my God, the pollen is everywhere. It is just, I mean, look up under the wiper doors, like right up here, just green dots of pollen everywhere. It's been just blowing in the breeze up here. So I guess I'm just going to keep trucking along here.
uh, pretty dark out here already. <laughs> that took quite a while. Um, I went through this whole thing with some uh, car wash soap. I don't remember the brand, but got the bucket out, got the microfiber out, and it's all cleaned off. No more pollen. Scrubbed everything down to the wheels. So I don't know. You guys probably can't really tell, but there's no more pollen. It's just some water. I know I'm not going to spend any time drying it off. I think that's about as good as I'm going to do it for right now. I got all the... Uh, the dust from the sanding taken off and pollen and the adhesive that was left over from taping everything up and I'm out of daylight. So I think what I'm gonna do next is turn the power back on this thing and I'm gonna see if she'll fire up. It's been a very long time since it's been on. Like I said, five weeks. So we got fresh oil. Ah, let's see if it works. Probably gonna have to jump start it or something. Normally that's what happens when it sits for a long period of time. Just because of the doors and stuff and leaving the hatch open there's you know a light on the dashboard or something funny so I end up having to either shut the battery off under the hood or go into the trunk and jump it but let's see what happens fired up for the first try it's been a while since it's been on again for the fourth time I walked around all the lights are working let's hear how she sounds sounds real nice Take a look at the dash, see if we have any lights on. Can't remember everything that I messed with for the last few weeks. I know we were pretty much focused on painting, but no, everything looks good. Let's see. Yeah, high beams, all this stuff's working. Idle's calmed back down. Idling at 14.6 to 15.1 back and forth on the AFR. Obviously the driver's side door is open and the e-brake's on, so got a couple of those lights lit up. But other than that, sounds really nice. I miss driving this thing. I've been driving that blue focus for the last five weeks or so. And let me tell you, you put your foot down on that thing, it's nothing, nothing at all compared to putting your foot down on this. Getting on the highway is kind of a task with that thing. This, you you guys know. You guys know what I'm talking about. Getting a little bit of boost is always a blast. I'm gonna turn off these fans in here. I forgot, I also uh, fixed all the wiring a while ago, so all the wiring is now set for the radiator fans, so we don't have to worry about turning the fans on with Link, or turning them off, or leaving them on all the time, or any of that stuff, so that makes me happy. Uh, gotta get used to being in this again. I don't know, um, I've cleaned the interior out today, vacuumed it out a little bit, wiped down some stuff, it was pretty dusty. Got a couple more things to tackle, but... The GSX is back, it's alive, the hood's painted, it's back on, and it's been washed. So I think we're gonna go ahead and pull the laptop out here in a minute. Okay boys, it is dark out. It's really, really dark out. And we're sitting out here in the Eclipse. And uh, the key's on, the engine's off. So basically this is gonna be the part of the video that we are going to go over uh, what to do in case your ECM Link laptop dies or your tablet's pooped or whatever. Maybe uh, like me, it started with uh, my Dell Inspirian 7370 deciding that it didn't want to boot one day, so I had to uh, reinstall Windows on it. Once I did that, all my programs and stuff needed to be re-downloaded. Saved all my uh, personal information, but didn't save all the personal programs that I had downloaded. It just kind of restores it back to stock. Sure, you can set up a restore point, uh, you can make backups, but even if you make a backup of Link, it does not set up your data log screen the same way. If you haven't messed around with it at all, or you're not quite sure how to do it, I'll give you guys just a quick overview, uh, and also introduce you to my brand new, let's see if I can show you guys this. Like I said, I was using a Dell Inspirian 7370, and I was editing all my videos, going through and making all the t-shirt designs and stuff on that computer, and it had a 620, Adreno 620 Intel graphics card, which is very, very slow. Uh, this has a what was it geforce rtx 3060 ti and a 11th gen i7 processor i believe so this is a rogue zephyrus gaming laptop um and this thing is a beast compared to the last laptop fun fact not that many of you guys are too tacky or not i don't know maybe this will be interesting maybe it won't be this laptop compared to my old laptop is six thousand 600 times faster with GPU performance. Um, sometimes it boots twice. Don't know why. Anyways, this thing's got a bunch of RGB. I got a nice uh, keyboard for it. 
and if you guys are gamers out there this is definitely one of the laptops you want to pick up uh, Asus Rogue Zephyrus laptops uh, Asus ROG um, they make the WUX GA model which this one is but they're all really really good and I never thought I'd be a gamer but I started playing uh, some PC games I went out and bought a $50 uh, Logitech G530 I think it's called I can't remember a nice gaming uh, gaming mouse that has some RGB and like extra programmable buttons so you can plug your mouse in and play your games and you can remap the additional buttons that are on the mouse there's not just right click left click and then the click on the roller there's like five six seven buttons that are all along the sides and edges made it super fun I started playing this game God of War which is just awesome so anyways I'm gonna go ahead and uh, fire up ECM link and show you guys what you have to do basically once you get this thing restarted here's what you're gonna do you're gonna plug in your brand new laptop and you're not gonna be able to connect you're gonna download ECM tuning or you can go to ecmtuning.com and you're gonna download the latest and greatest version which is version 3.36.73 and you're gonna pick either for your Windows computer Mac OS or your Linux setup if you have either one of these three Linux setups um, we have Windows here and it's Windows 10 soon we going to be updating to a Windows 11 that'll work right here it says 7 8 10 and 11 should be on there um, so you're gonna start downloads you're gonna do this whole process that pops up and you're also going to have to come down here to the bottom and click on the Windows installer app and you're gonna download that also these are the drivers to connect your USB a port to the car so you're gonna plug in you're gonna find that it's gonna say uh, serial port connection failed or something like that and what you have to do is download these drivers in order to make sure that they can talk to one another the computer and uh, ECM link so you get this it pops up and uh, the requested operation required elevation okay boom drivers are done now we should be able to go over here close our settings out we should be able to go back into ECM link once the drivers are installed and programs are installed and top left here we can click on our connect button and there we go now everything is starting to read it's starting to connect life is good and this is the first time we've connected to this laptop with this car since we picked up the new one so sorry I can't keep getting it's so hard to get this thing in frame right now because it's so big all right, so we're connected. We've got the drivers, we've got ECM link. All my data logs are still intact after transferring over all my information, so that's a good thing. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start a stream. There we go. We've started a stream, and as you can tell, the bottom of the screen is all completely different than what it was on the last video you watched with ECM link here. And that's where the more pain in the butt process starts. So what we have to do is change the way our display setup is set up. Um, we're going to close this by clicking on the little red X at the top of the page, which is right over there. And we're going to go back over here into ECU Config Live. We're going to open that up. We're going to go through our settings and make sure all of them look all right. ECU Inputs, that's where we're going to go to. All right, so first thing is, let's see, front O2 sensor. We are going to change that to our wideband. And we're going to go all the way down to uh, User Defined Linear Wideband. Linear, linear wideband and it pops up right here it says user defined linear wideband right there and we're gonna change what it's displayed as so I usually make these things just say exactly what they are this is an AEM wideband type it in real fast and leave it now when we search for our captured values we're gonna be searching for AEM wideband um, intake temp sensor we also have one of those what do we have? We have a GMIAT. So we're going to go down to the G's and we're going to pick GMIAT and we're going to rename that just to make it easier to find later. We're going to call this one also the GMIAT. Uh, let's see. MDP sensor is now our map sensor. So we're going to click that and we have a three bar hooked up. So we are going to find our OmniPower three bar which oh, right down here boom click OmniPower 3 bar now over here it says the input pin so this is where the EC looks and tries to find these sensors it's saying uh, the barrow sensor which is in the wire cluster for the uh, MAF sensor 
Um, coolant temp obviously is a coolant temp sensor that's in the thermostat housing. Front O2 we've pulled out and we've replaced it with our AEM wideband. So that's what we put in front for now. We called it our linear wideband. Our intake air temp sensor is a GM IAT and that is using the ECM tuning uh, MAF breakout cable with speed density breakout points. So we can run our IAT or a MAP sensor there. We only have our IAT set up there. Um, and then the MDP sensor is that weird sensor that's on top of your intake manifold. And that usually is part of the, the EGR EVAP stuff. We've pulled that out and replaced it with our OmniPower three bar map. All right, that's the easy part. We've clicked all our sensors. And now what we're gonna do is click save pin assignments. And we are going to hit okay. We're gonna stop our stream. We're gonna go back into ECU Live. If you don't stop the stream, you won't be able to save your pin assignments and then click captured values and edit these captured values. So we're going to have to add a lot of stuff to our data logs. All the stuff that we used to have is now gone. So we're going to click on AEM wideband. We're going to add to device. All the stuff that's already bold is already in the system. Anything that's not bold on this column, you have to add over like flex fuel adjust. I'd have to add because it's not bold. So I'm just going to go through this list real fast. Make sure that I got everything that I want before my log screen. Pretty much everything that we're gonna need hooked up and saved. So we're gonna click OK. We're gonna jump back into our main page here and we're gonna go back in and start another stream. And this is where we're gonna go through and add everything and add all the parameters that we wanna see and make this screen look as useful to us as it can be. So now that we're in our, our screen here, what we're gonna do is we're going to go to the bottom of the screen down here and we're going to right click and we are going to click on displayed values and it says displayed values right there real small click that and then you don't need this you don't need this message to show up and we're going to hit continue now these values right here are all the values that we were just messing around with inside of the uh, ecu live settings and uh, this is basically all the stuff that we want to see um, everything on the right is displayed. Everything in the column over here is not displayed. So normally I like to start my page out with knock. So we can click on knock and highlight it and then click this little up button. And if we hit okay, it's gonna move our knock to spot number one. Now here's where it gets to be a, kind of a pain in the butt because if you want your stuff organized like I like my stuff organized, uh, I use certain colors and certain text colors so knock I change to red I make the line thick red all that fun stuff uh, it gets to be kind of tough because each one of these boxes is numbered from left to right so knock is number one number two is rpm number three is airflow number four is front o2 number five is timing so if I want each column of my log to be set up with specific items like I want knock timing boost wideband uh, all that stuff on my left column and then other less important stuff over here So when I'm driving and logging I can look at my screen know where to look and Expect to see knock here expect to see coolant here expect to see AFR estimate here all that stuff It's, it's kind of a pain so knock is number one number five would be timing and then six seven eight and number nine where throttle position is would be uh, Let's see. Let's see. It would be timing and uh, so on and so forth. So this is where it gets to be kind of a pain because you have to right click down here, you have to go down to displayed values, and then you have to go through our list and pick the items that you want to have displayed in the same place that you had them prior. Phew, okay boys. It took me probably a lot longer than it should have to get this all set up, but now my old data log screen for the most part matches with my new data log screen and I just pulled this right off of YouTube I paused this and now there we are we have our data log screen all put back together um, I had to change under preferences all these things you can change just by right clicking and then at the top of the list it says knock ret preferences you click that you can change the line color the thickness of the lines um, the display color the size uh, you can mess with all this stuff just if you add a map sensor, make sure you look up your elevation, go into your preferences. This is um, our, what was it, OmniPower 3-bar. I changed the name over to regular just boost. 
It makes it easier for me. Then there's the boost estimate underneath it, which is accurate around 5,000 RPMs. Um, so I always keep that there. So when I hit 5,000 RPMs, whatever my target boost is, I can verify that boost here matches boost estimate when I hit five grand if I'm looking at the RPMs. Um, anyways, go in and change the boost preferences to your altitude. There's a little box in the top right that comes up and you're all set. So now, as you guys can see, we are data logging right here live. Uh, we can go back into our configurations, our direct access, stop our captures, stop our streams, whatever we want to do, close this stuff out, and we can actually fire the car up finally and uh, go for a drive. So it's been about, I don't know, five, six weeks, like I said, multiple times now since I've taken this thing out and driven it. So I'm going to go ahead and fire it up and take it for a cruise. I'm going to leave you guys all right here. And uh, stay tuned because we're going to have another fun project to knock out next week. Uh, just a bunch of stuff back to back to back to back. So this is the upload for the week of, what is it? What is it? What is it? I can't remember the 6th, I think, today is. Am I right? No, it can't be the 6th, is it? Yes, it is. It's the 6th. So anyways, it's May 6th. We'll see you guys again next week, either on uh, Monday or Tuesday, maybe Wednesday at the latest. I'm going to try to keep uploads coming out by Wednesday at the latest. So for the rest of the summer, hopefully we can keep knock, knocking these projects out and you guys will uh, have some, some videos to watch and hopefully enjoy them. So anyways, I'm going to sign off now. We'll see you right back here for the next one. Check out that thumbs up silhouette, guys. Anyways, take care.